A lot of people think of obesity as a lifestyle disease, and of course there's a lifestyle component to it, but there is also a very strong genetic component to it. And we've known this for quite some time, and even just from observational data that's shown that you know brothers and sisters tend to have similar uh, BMIs, we tend to have similar body shapes and tendencies for body fat distribution patterns, similar to our parents. Um, and like it says here, we've seen that obesity does seem to cluster within families. And some of the evidence that kind of grew from that is we started to look at if we want to understand the genetic origins of obesity, let's start looking at you know what twin studies might show us, because in twin studies, you know, especially um, identical twins, they have the exact same DNA. So we're going to look at some of that evidence, the, the monozygotic twin evidence as far as um, obesity and its genetic origins. And we're also in this uh, module going to explore something called genome mapping and specifically something called genome-wide association studies, which have looked at various populations around the world and tried to find out what kind of genetic um, changes are more common in people with obesity compared to people that maybe are a bit leaner. So that's some of the evidence that we're going to consider in this unit. Okay. So like I mentioned, a lot of the earlier evidence into the genetic origins of obesity comes from twin studies, and it's not actually even that old. There was a seminal paper back in 1986 where they looked at the intrapair correlation as far as BMI goes, comparing monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. And they found that with monozygotic twins, the correlation coefficient was... Um, much higher, showing a stronger correlation between the two, compared to a lower um, coefficient with dizygotic twins. And you can kind of just see that by looking at these pictures and the body shapes of monozygotic twins compared to these dizygotic twins, which again will have similar genetics, but not identical genetics like we would see in the monozygotic or identical twins. Okay, so this is some, like I said, of the earlier evidence for that um, genetic basis of obesity. Another study that was pretty seminal in showing the genetic linkages between obesity and uh, especially fat mass gain is this paper out of um, Laval University in Quebec here in Canada. And what they did is they took 12 pairs of identical twins, so 24 people total, and they brought them to the university and they basically housed these people for um, about 100 days. And before they came, they found out approximately how much each of those people ate regularly. So they had to then record their diet for a while, found out how much they regularly ate. And let's say one of those twins ate 2,000 calories a day. Well, they added 1,000 calories to that. Okay, let's say there was another person who consumed 3,000 calories a day. Well, now they were consuming 4,000 calories. So for each uh, person, they raise the caloric intake by a thousand calories. So you would assume if we're all eating exactly the same extra calories, we would gain about the same extra weight. And that's not what they found. So if we look at the changes of, in body weight, um, on the y-axis we have twin A, and on the x-axis we have twin B and kind of the where they match up for these things, we actually see that some twins gained quite a bit of weight, okay, so this is in kilograms, up to about 13 kilograms in that 100-day period, and there was other twins that gained significantly less, about 5 kilograms in that 100-day period. But what they did found, although there was a lot of heterogeneity between the weight gain of individuals within that study, of those 24 individuals within that study, what they did find was that the amount of weight that one twin gained correlated best to what the other twin gained. So that's what this line more or less shows here. So for instance, if one twin, so this circle here, this shows us that if one twin gained eight kilograms, the other twin gained about the same, okay? So here we have a twin that gained about 11 kilograms and their twin gained about 13. Okay, so there was a lot of variability in how much weight was gained, even though they were consuming the exact same amount of extra calories, 
but how much weight they gained was very correlated with what their twin gained, which again suggests that there's something genetic going on that is correlating with uh, their propensity for gaining fat mass. And if we look at actually how much visceral fat they gained, uh, as opposed to just how much total weight, the correlation coefficient goes up even further. Okay, so we have a stronger correlation between the weight gain of one, the visceral fat mass gain of uh, one twin versus the other. Again, showing that, um, that genetic factors are playing some role in the gain of fat mass and our likelihood to gain fat mass. So at this point, it's important to clarify between two concepts, and that's the concept of monogenetic causes and polygenetic causes, causes of diseases or various factors. So when we say a disease or some sort of status is monogenetic, that means that basically one mutation in the alleles of one gene is promoting that outcome, that obesity or that whatever else. And this is the kind of easy stuff. If there's one monogenetic change, we know that, you know, it's easier to figure out what that is, or it's easier to even kind of consider how we can deal with that as well. However, as not just with obesity, but with a lot of other diseases, why it's actually harder to figure out the complete story of the genetic origins of the disease is that these diseases tend to be polygenic, which means that it's not caused by one gene, basically that each of those kind of genetic changes has some sort of additive effect on promoting whatever we see, so in this case, in obesity. Okay, so each kind of genetic, uh, the, the, the effect of each genetic change um, has small effect, but together they create this larger effect. And that's what we, like I said, see in obesity more than anything else. Okay, so when it comes to the monogenetic causes of obesity, we know some of them, and these do happen. So we've, of course, we've already learned about the OBOB mouse, and uh, with uh, leptin deficiency, but this is extremely rare, like we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, we saw the DBDB mouse as well, which is another example of a monogenetic cause of obesity. But the one that is actually the most common, and even still it's not that common, is a uh, defect in the melanocortin-4 receptor, which is part of the appetite regulation pathway in the hypothalamus. Okay, and the POMC deficiency, that's actually um, associated with appetite as well. But again, all these monogenetic causes of obesity are a lot more rare, okay, and they're typically not the cause of obesity, like one of the main causes of obesity that we see as far as the population level goes, okay? That said, a little bit more about um, uh, genetic changes in obesity uh, brings us to the FTO story, okay? So the FTO story, the, the uh, fat mass associated gene is what this is called. It was first cloned in mice in the late 90s. And in 2007, two seminal papers linked uh, this FTO gene and human obesity. Specifically, what was found is that mice that downregulated FTO were resistant to, to obesity, and those that overexpressed its gene product were at higher risk for it. Okay, and what is believed, although we still have lots to learn about the FTO um, uh, story, is that this FTO variant somehow is affecting um, appetite. Okay, appetite, calories consumed, uh, total amount of calories uh, that come in, and especially fat calories as well. Okay, so FTO is not believed to be a monogenic um, cause of obesity. It is believed to be a, a part of the polygenic uh, origin of obesity um, because it's kind of its effect isn't typically as large to promote obesity within an individual as from what we have seen. Um, as far as what this gene actually does, um, it is known to encode a demethylase that has been linked with certain pathways involved in obesity. And we're going to get back to that when we talk about epigenetics and obesity. Okay. Um, again, we're not fully sure about what um, the role of this gene product is, but it is believed that um, if there's an intron variant in this FTO, um, it may promote obesity through gain of expression of that particular um, gene. Okay. And like we saw 
um, in this slide, we learned that those mice, when in mouse studies, those that overexpress that FTO uh, gene product were more likely to have obesity and to eat a lot of calories, especially fat calories. Okay, which makes sense when you know that uh, this is highly expressed in the hypothalamus, which we're going to spend a lot of time on when we talk about appetite. Okay, and we believe that again, it has something to do with feeding. Okay, perhaps there's some sort of modulation of the leptin stat three pathway, and or uh, nucleic acid uh, repair and modification. And like like I said earlier, it might actually be more linked to epigenetic um, origins of obesity as opposed to um, uh, monogenic or polygenic um, causes. So there are many hypotheses as to what this um, gene actually uh, contributes to. So it could be actually involved in the browning of fat as well. Like we've been looking at, it's probably involved in food intake too. Um, it might be involved in the um, genesis of adipocytes and perhaps in mitochondrial thermogenesis as well, which kind of links it to browning too, okay? So like many things, it's probably not one pathway, but this is again another area we're still trying to explore but the main kind of idea here is this FTO gene we really just learned about it recently like less than 20 years ago and it's really opened things up for us realizing that there's all these kind of little changes that might be happening in the genomes of certain individuals with obesity that cumulatively add up to an increased risk of obesity okay the story of FTO also really shines a light on how difficult it is to like tease apart all this genetic information when it comes to um, the genetic origins of obesity. Okay, so like it says here, even though this region harbors the largest effect on BMI, and we're going to see this again in a bit, um, of any of the single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with polygenic obesity, its mechanism of action is still not fully clear and we don't know <laughs> you know i'm always asking myself like what do we do with this knowledge how does this help us we really don't know that um yet okay but again one of the main messages i want to take from this particular submodule is that there are some diseases disorders uh, etc that have this monogenic I think I've been saying monogenetic monogenic <laughs> origin but really when it comes to obesity and a lot of other disorders as well it's more likely uh, a polygenic um, genetic origin where again the cumulative effect of changes in particular uh, genetic loci are adding up to this cumulative effect of increasing risk for disease probably through different pathways. But what we're gonna see is actually one of the main ways that these genetic changes we believe promote obesity is through changing appetite regulation pathways, which we'll talk way more about in the next module on appetite. Um, but we'll come back in the next module of this module series to talk a little bit more about polygenic causes of obesity, specifically looking at genome-wide association studies and what they've shown us.